Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is Architectural Patterns of this Resilient Distributed Systems. Uh, my name is Ines Sombra, and I am an engineer at a company called Fastly. Uh, this is how you get a hold of me. And I'm also part of an organization called Papers We Love. Hello to all of the organizers and speakers that are here. Woo! Yay! So, and hello to everybody that is watching this from home. If you're watching this talk or any strange loop talk and you don't know what Papers We Love is, uh, I highly recommend that you go and join your local chapter because it's awesome. So, I work for Fastly. I don't know if you know what Fastly is. This is kind of fuzzy. Uh, it's a content delivery network and uh, basically it's a globally distributed network of service, servers. Uh, so you should really check us out. We had a booth here. We shut it down so we can all be here. Uh, but real time is our thing, so if you're interested, just like ping us after the talk. Let's talk about what we're going to cover today. So we're going to go on a journey together. And uh, first part, we're going to try to figure out why we should care about this thing called resiliency. Then we're going to check and see what the literature tells us, and then see what the industry tells us about it. And then we're going to mesh everything together into this big, huge pile of conclusions. So I bet you thought I was going to go somewhere else, huh? So I don't know how many of you have seen my talks before. If you haven't seen my talks before, uh, this is my obligatory disclaimer slide. Things that you can expect from this talk, I put it in this little table over here. So you can expect pugs, fast talking, life pondering, and tweetable moments, because you may want to tweet it, but I'm going to speak really fast, and then you won't be able to. So fuck it. Let's not do it. Ranty Festus, what surprised me this year, and also, Wedding trivia. So, so uh, I'm getting married in 20 days. Yes. Woo. And uh, I kind of underestimated the amount of stress that you would go <laughs> whenever you're about to get married and you have to make a talk. So uh, this talk has a lot more of me in it because I am unable to filter out the things I shouldn't say. So yeah, also apologies to Norma, whom I'm going to torture through the duration of this talk, trying to see uh, how fast she can, she can close caption this. So yeah, why resilience? So uh, a year ago, uh, did she say something? <laughs> yeah, yeah, good. So, uh, so a year ago, I became a distributed systems engineer. So before, I used to dabble, and, and I decided to just kind of make it official and see what it looked like from, from the, the engineering point of view, and then just actually do that as a daytime job. So I switched jobs, and I started my first day as a distributed system engineer, and then I realized quickly after that my entire perspective had changed. So before, it was kind of like more operational, some more orchestration, and a different thing, and then now I had to like help construct these systems and help the system stay up. And uh, that, was a little, that was a little different. So everything that I had read before and I thought I understood, all of a sudden became just like everything that I thought it was obvious. Once I was in there, in the middle of it, it didn't really become as obvious anymore. So, so it's just like everything changed and everything all became new. And then I had to go and read the same papers that I had read before with no context, with much, much more context. So I started wondering, what are the things that I'm going to make to this particular application that is going to actually like, make it less, less robust? And, and, and I, I noticed that, for example, when I interacted with one system, I caused availability problems in another. Basically, means that I just like, fucking brought it down. So, so that was like, yeah, I knew that this was going to happen, but I didn't think it was going to happen to me. So, so yeah, so yeah, <laughs> it happens to everybody, I guess. And then I also had an opportunity to start like a new prototype. And in that app prototype, everything that I had read before kind of like loomed over my head. And, and, and it was a little paralyzing because I didn't know what I was going to if, if the things that I was making at that moment were going to be like the biggest pieces of shit that everybody that works with me has seen or not. So uh, the, key the, the key takeaway is also copy the patterns that are already there because they've already come up with them. So that, that, that was a good initiative. Initial, initial thing. So let's talk about resilience. So for the sake of this talk, I'm going to define resilience as the ability of a system to keep working or adapt whenever things that are expected or unexpected happen. So in the, resilient bag, the resilience bag, I'm also going to put fault tolerance, evolvability, scalability, failure isolation, and complexity management, because we only have 40 minutes. And I can speak fast, but not that fast. So, so as I was starting to work on this, I, I also like then it was, it's been a year over like churning and churning, and this is kind of like what I, I wish I would have known when I joined a little bit. And it's just kind of like, okay, they're like very humble like points of views, but, but I had to like actually work to get here. So, so it's interesting. But at the end of the day, I think for me, resilience is what really matters. So, so you can have a nice UI, you can have a really good product, and, and, and if you have no solid foundation to stand on, it will cost your business things like resources, operational expenses, time, and it may even cost your system customers. It may even cost, uh, cost your business customers. 
So, so it matters, and at least it matters to me. So whenever now I'm, I'm designing a new thing or I'm helping with something else, the first thing that is on my mind is resilience and everything else. It's like, well, my code may be not pretty, or may, I mean, we may not be using a language that is like super awesome, but, but resilience is like now what is at the, at, the, at the forefront of my mind. So I said that we had, like, we had, I had read some literature, so I read a lot of literature, and then there were three models that actually stuck with me and changed a little bit my perspective even more. So they're going to go through them fairly quickly, but, but, and then we're just going to carry on. So the first model that I picked is called Harvest and Yield. And this paper is a little, it's an oldie but goodie. Uh, it, it's, it was uh, produced in 1999 by Armando Fox and Eric Brewer. And, and, the, and I read it recently again from this new, this new life that I have now. And, and I think the reason that it's, like, it's still like, so poignant and then so important is because it formalizes the concept that we use now to build distributed systems. And then also like, it gives us some ideas of strategies so we can enhance system availability in the presence of failure. Also, like, it gives us some patterns that we can, that we can use to make things more resilient. So this paper has two concepts that are like that, that uh, it relies for everything else that it tells you, and, and we're going to describe them again very quickly. Uh, we have yield, that is the fraction of the successfully answered queries. And it's kind of close to uptime, but it's not really uptime. So for example, say that you have something that sells shit, and then this is Christmas, and people are trying to access your store, and you have two minutes of downtime. That has a completely different yield than if your site goes down for two minutes on a Wednesday morning at 3 AM. So, so it's, a, it's, like, it's much more related to the user experience, and then uptime as a metric miss, misses that. So the paper tells us that we should focus on yield rather than uptime. Harvest now is a fraction of the complete results. Say for the, I borrowed this example from CODAS, uh, which basically is being quoted all through this, converse, this, this talk. So it seems like CODA emerges once every year, publishes a few things, and then we use his like, slides forever and ever, and we compose great, great talks. But it's all of it. Like, just go check that, that, that uh, reference. So then he's asked, he, says, he tells us that we can have, like, OK, this example where we have cute baby animals, and the indexes are in different service servers, and, and I want to search for cute baby animals. And then my server B goes down. But you can see that now, with one server gone, I can have still 66% of, of harvest and still have kind of like, like offer something that would be acceptable to me. Like I would say cute and animals, there's bound to be babies there. So, so yeah. So again, those two concepts are very important. But I, what I want to like emphasize is the strategies that the, papers te the paper tells us. So the first strategy that they say, uh, uh, that they tell us, is called probabilistic availability. And this deals with graceful degradation of services, uh, systems under faults. And then they also tell us that we can use randomness, that is like we can make the same case. This, we can even out the worst case and the average case scenario. This is, for example, if I'm going to distribute my data to, uh, like randomly through all of my nodes, and one of my nodes goes down, then at least it's a random portion of my data. And then it also tells us that we can replicate high demand data that is like high priority. So we can just actually control a little bit our harvest. So the likelihood of losing that if one node dies is a little bit lesser because it's, it, copies of it exist in more places. And also they tell us that we can use uh, degrading the result. Degrading the result is almost like what we've saw, uh, saw with, um, with harvest that base, is based on client capability. This is, for example, I have my phone and I want to watch a video, and my connection is not great, and I get a lesser quality of video. But it's still like it's, it's fairly OK. The second strategy that they tell us is called uh, decomposition and orthogonality. And it, this deals with like we push down everything. Instead of like having it at the top level, we push it down into independent, independent subsystems that they may or may not be uh, tolerant to have a degradation, but our entire application can continue, making, can continue operating if those subsystems fail. Uh, also, this gives us the advantage of only having to worry about providing strong cons consistency for the subsystems that need it. And I, I hope that I'm keeping at a good pace. Am I, is this too fast or too, too, too slow? Am I OK? OK, cool. So I, I've been told that it's OK. Uh, and then we can have a leverage orthogonal mechanisms. And this is, for example, when you're trying to I, I care about security, and I may leverage like a library or something that does encryption and security for me, but I don't have to actually build it or, or, or codify a, like a security thing in my, in my application. So we have then the concepts, and then we have these two strategies that the paper proposes us. And then, but the thing that, that was made the most impact for me was that if your system favors uh, harvest or yield, it, it's, an, it's an outcome of the design. So, so in a way, this, this was a thing that, I, that is like the most useful thing for me because they're basically the things that we actually have to pay attention to when we're there. So the next model that I had, uh, is, it actually comes from healthcare industry, and I, I really, really like this one as well. 
And, and, and they say that, okay, that the systems tend to be uh, always at operating at the edge of failure because we always want to maximize our system's capacities. And that, that any system that we launch into the world and starts to get used and is relied upon is going to become safety critical. So in this model, they have the world and the universe where we have three boundaries. Uh, the boundary on the tank is the accident boundary. Then we have the economic failure boundary, and then we have the acceptable, the unacceptable workload boundary. And then the thing in blue is the operating point. So it's kind of like where we are in the world. So we have pressures that come from, from one set of boundaries. Say, for example, we wanted, we needed to make this more efficient. And then it moves the operating point. And then maybe, say, we have like, OK, reduce cost, and then the operating point just goes. And then at this point, we have an incident, Woo. So because it crossed the accident boundary. So we really don't like to have an incident. We don't really want to have outage problems or, or resilience problems in our application. So we are like, OK, we crack down and be like, let's go and launch a safety campaign. And the safety campaign moves the operating point back from the accident boundary. So we do this over and over. And then at some point, we realize that maybe there's a, there's a little bit of a buffer between the accident boundary and, and, and us. So we end up creating what is called a marginal boundary. And we have this little thing that is like our perceived or our empirical error margin. So that, this is very nice. And then this keeps going and on, going on and on. So this, the operating point is always in motion. It always moves. And then at some point, uh, we may or may not cross the accident boundary, depending on how, how, we, uh, how, how we are um, close to, depending on our position to the, to the marginal boundary. So say that we were to zoom in into the accident and the marginal boundary relationship. Uh, and then it's OK. Like, so we are like, really getting, getting used to like, not having outages. And then our operating point is in an acceptable, like, acceptable place, which is like, on, like, inside the, the marginal boundary. But it's like, OK, maybe one day, accidentally, we go over it. And it's like, oh, we freak out. And then it's just like, oh, like, we should do the things the way that we know how to, how to do them. And we go then back into the marginal boundary, and where we consider acceptable. But you know what? Like, last time, we didn't crash. So fuck it. Let's, let's go it again. And you're like, OK, we didn't crash here either. So well, maybe we go over this way, and then maybe we go over this one. And we kind of get comfortable in this point where we know that we're very close to the edge. We don't really know where the edge is. But at this point, we just like, started living really close to it. And what ends up happening is that you end up defining a new marginal boundary. So what are you going to fail on? It's not likely to change. But then like, your closeness to, 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 the, to the error is, is, is like, it's much, much, uh, it's like it's more. You're just much more closer to that. Obviously, we have many examples of this, and now I see it everywhere. This talk, for example, is like me, like right next to my, my accident boundary. Like, yeah, it's like right there. So, so yeah, so I guess you can tell me, well, this is fine. It's like, we still haven't crossed it. This is great. So, yeah, maybe. Um, obviously, we don't really want to do that, as I told you. I am trying to be in this point in my life uh, concerned about resiliency, so I would not condone this, 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 this way of living. So it's OK. So what are the insights from, from the, the model that Cook tells us? And then this is, again, from the healthcare industry. They say that in order to actually engineer something with resiliency, it requires a model of safety that is based on mentoring, responding, adapting, and learning. Also, that the system safety is about what can happen and where the operating point actually is, and what do we do under pressure. Actually, in their study, they said that uh, the difference between hotels, uh, hotels uh, hospitals with high mortality and no mort uh, low mortality rates is like, the way they respond to the incidents. Like, the accidents happen in both of them, but one is actually, like, much more adapted and fluid, and it's able to, like, not kill people nicer or better than the other one. So, so yeah, don't kill people. But uh, the, the thing that they tell us, too, is that it's resilience operator, it's, it's like, this resilience is also, like, focused on the operator community. So from the Harvest and Yield, we have design. From this one, we have, actually, the, like, a case for why operations matter. So. All right, how do they tell us that we should build resilience in our system? They tell us that we should actually like, build support for continuous maintenance. That seems reasonable. Uh, also, that we should reveal the control to the systems for the operators and actually reveal the whole control, because basically they're going to be the ones that are dealing with your, with your system. We may agree or may not agree on that one. But the thing that is, that is important, or at least a thing that, that, that stuck with me, is that basically you should really know that, you're, that your system is going to get moved, replaced, and used in ways you didn't intend. Like, period. It's, like, it's, it's going to happen. And then you should also think about your configuration as interfaces. So that, that is a cook model. 
So for the next one, I went to uh, a friend and I was like, okay, so what else can I do? Give me a different perspective. And he's like, sure, just read this paper. And then read this paper. And then read this paper. And then this read this paper. And it went on and on for like two weeks. So I'm just going to call it the Borel model. So it's Paul Borel. If you were at Chris's talk, he also like mentioned things to Chris. So this guy is kind of prolific at the reading papers and then bombarding you with them. But they're very, very good. <laughs> so. In this case, I'm just going to take a little bit of a, a, a liberty and, and, and just like not show my work, but tell you the gist of what I got from all of those papers, too, because I read them. Uh, so they give us a different visualization for system complexity. So they said that in one side, we have the probability of a failure. On the other side, we have the rank. And the rank is defined as the order of the most probable to the least probable. And then with that, that also like this, this and then there's um, areas of where it's like least probable. Uh, no, most probable is you can, we can address with traditional engineering. Then we can go to this thing called like reactive operations, where like maybe we cross the error boundary. It's like ah, oh, we shouldn't do this again. And then we now we put like either into a playbook or something that we do. And then there's this area called unk unk, which also Peter Bailey's covered, but he spelled it out. I kind of like the unk unk because it kind of sounds like skunk or whatever, but it means unknown unknown. So, and this is where you have the cascading or catastrophic failures. So you don't know where they're gonna come. And, 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 and the thing that my chart doesn't really, doesn't really display very well is that it goes on, and then eventually the area of this unknown is gonna be as big as the other two combined. So trust me on that one. Uh, I don't really have time to make it even prettier than what it is, so what? So, okay. Another thing that they tell us is whenever we scale, the areas under the curve start to change, and then that we can truncate the front a little bit by explicitly like, putting some mitigations in place, but then we renormalize and the tail starts getting fatter, and then the unk unk begins to like, dominate more and more as, like, this is, as the system starts scaling up. So the interesting thing is like, it's great, all right, so we first like, had design, then we had operations, and now we know that maybe we're just like, our attention should be split in three, in three different places where we can have engineering and there's other thing that is gonna come and get us and we, there's nothing we can do. So what does the poll says is that, okay, this, this different things that we have in our world should require different strategies of attack or different, different mechanisms. So like different failure errors should, should match to different strategies in order to, like, to like, be concerned about them. And then what he also mentioned that it would be really kind of cool is like basically we have the Kingsbury on one side it's like, and then we also like have like just the other on the other. So this is kind of like the, the, the embodiment of the strategies. Uh, and if you're building a system, imagine getting your report card from those two guys combined. So it's like you're never, never, you leave the industry forever and then start weaving baskets or something. <laughs> but, but yeah, okay, so like we need different strategies. So what are the strategies that we have? Or what are the tools that we have for each one of them? For example, for classical engineering, we have things like code standards, uh, programming pattern, testing, you should test the full system. By this point, we should know that the full system is the client, the code, the provisioning code, and also maybe your operations start mattering from the, from the, from the model before, right? And we should have metrics and monitoring, all of this should be your MVP, you shouldn't wait until like, you put the system in production and you're like, ha, ah, how do I see it? And, and also another thing that is interesting with classical engineering and some of the other papers that I read, is that, that basically we're striving for something that is, that is a convergence to a good state. So we want the system to be able to at least like kill itself enough or just like not freak out enough to the point in which it can just go and then start like behaving the way that we expect it. Uh, in reactive operations, we have things like hazard inventories, redundancies, feature flags, dart deploys, uh, run books and cook, and, and docs and canaries and things like that. And in the unknown unknown, we have things like system verification, formal methods, things like fault injections, because basically this is the area that we just don't know. We can't predict, we weren't able to see, because if we were able to see, we were already engineered for it. But the goal of these things, I think that the goal of like everything combined, well, the first two combines, the other ones you can't do much about it, uh, but it's to build a failure domain independence. Uh, so, so it's like if there's a failure on this area of your system, it won't take down your entire application. So again, we can map it down to the first paper, and then we see like the, this, this ability to, like, to respond to failures is, is, keeps popping up again and again, uh, which means that maybe I weave my topics correctly, so yay. So, okay, so from the Borel method, uh, the, uh, the, the thing that I took away from is that, okay, thinking about res system resilience means that we have to use more than one discipline in order to, in order to just like attack it properly. So if one discipline is insufficient, we should use more, and, and, and this is what we take away from the third, the third literature model that, I, that I, I prepared for you. But it also just kind of sucks, right? Because we have to like, like protect ourselves against three different fronts now. So it kind of follows our intuitions, but it's kind of like a bummer as well. So, I promise you wedding trivia now. So, uh, I wonder if you knew what this is. This is a wedding cake, right? 
It's like wrong, it's not a wedding cake. There's this session on Etsy where you can get fake wedding cakes. This one, for example, is $160 and it's fake. It's basically styrofoam with some sort of sugar thing on top that looks like a wedding cake, so you can wow your guests with a wedding cake. And for $10 more, you can actually have them carve out a little piece so we can shove some real cake and then you eat it and pretend you have really good cake and then you serve your guests really cheap cake. Because that wedding cakes are really expensive. So also, fuck the wedding industry, it's the worst. So. Um, if you were wondering how much it costs you to have a 20 to 35 minute ceremony in San Francisco, you're looking around 600 to 1,000 dollars. Another one, so that's great, right? Mm. 20 days, uh, I don't have an officiant yet, or I kind of have one in the works, but who knows? So yeah, I'm not stressed about that one either. So okay. Let's talk about resilience in industry. So it wouldn't be a distributed systems talk if we don't quote like distributed systems poster child. So I go and then here's my Netflix thing. So I do want to lead some thoughts. So my Netflix with sparkles. So, so okay. So what did I pull for like for the Netflix uh, best literature? So they had this blog post uh, a while ago, a few years ago, that they talk about their, their API and how they're doing fault isolation at the API level. And then they find out that, OK, the API, as we probably know, is inherently more vulnerable to any system failures uh, or latencies in the stack. We probably know this. I knew this. But then I was causing availability issues in our API. And I was like, what the fuck is this thing not staying up? So, so yeah, so sometimes you need the context. Um, they also said that in their system, without any sort of fault tolerance, and when, when you have like around 30 dependencies, that they were all around like four nines of uptime, it could resolve them in about like two hours of downtime per month. So not great, right? And the way that they solve this is by that they actually use client libraries. And they provided these client libraries to the rest of the, the organization. So in here, for example, in this picture, you have a, a request. And then it's just finding out like the things to the dependencies. And this is how it looked like after they architected it. So basically, they created pools for each type of dependencies. And they started using aggressive network timeouts, retries, or semaphores. Uh, they also did, like, well, OK, I told you just now that they separated the threads on a per dependency pools. And then since they had timeouts, basically, they, they wanted to prevent this thing, for, um, threads from locking and then just consuming all of the resources on the pool. Uh, the interesting thing is that they talk about like circuit breakers as well. And then it means that basically, say, for example, they notice over 50% error rate in a span of 10, 10 seconds, then they will back off and then just like, try to relieve the pressure and only start sending things to the system that they were talking to after the health check like, came, back, came back OK. And actually, they said also, too, that exceptions cost the app to shed load until things are healthy. So again, we've seen this before in the literature section with our first model. All right, good. So that is Netflix. We can get, move on to the other one, because instead of having one poster child, I'm going to have two. Yeah. OK, this is Google. And they redefined their logo. So now Google has gotten skinnier. And if you're preparing for a wedding, you have to do that too. So yeah. <laughs> so uh, OK, which paper from Google I really, really love? Uh, I, when I was reading this, I think the one that stuck with me the most was the Chubby paper. And then the Chubby paper describes that the lock-in system that they have, and it's coarse grain, and then they also do fi small file storage. But then the reason that this paper is really, really nice is also because it describes their thought process and what it looks like whenever you're building something for people that, that, that are in your side of the fence, so you can't really call stupid, but they're kind of there. So you, like, you kind of want to go and enable them as well. So the key insights for the Chubby paper for me were that, OK, they also dealt with this, this, this decision between a library and a service. The Netflix people use a library in the particular like, blog post that they mentioned. And in this case, like, the people from Google decided to go and, and build a service. And they built the service, and also they did the client library. So they had control over both of, the, those, both, both of those two things. Uh, this is probably the thing that is the, the slowest I've said, right? So OK. So they also did a, a storage for, uh, they also like, did uh, support for small data files. And, and they, did, they restricted the operations that you could do with the files. And they restricted, like, you just couldn't pull on and put like, something like, huge. They just like, very, very carefully like, uh, delineated of what you could do and what you couldn't do. And the paper is kind of a bummer as well, because they said that engineers, uh, they found that their engineers uh, don't plan for availability, consensus, primary elections, failures, their own bugs, operability, or the future. And also, <laughs> they don't understand distributed systems. So like, fuck, it's like, it's like yeah, everything is awful. So, uh, so yeah, but uh, OK, fine. Just like, yes, they just have something, and you use it, and then like, uh, well, yeah. So it's so, all right. Good. Uh, more key insights since we're here, and then we're just already depressed. Uh, 
Centralized services are hard to construct, but you can actually dedicate some effort into making them more uh, failure tolerant and architect them well and making sure that they're just like resistant and, 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 and scalable and even and just like you can just consume this, this thing that has been like well, well architected or, or constructed for you. And also they found out that restricting what you could do with this service actually increased their resilience because they had like one thing and then to do it very, very well. And, and also like, okay, fine. Like the consumers of your service are like basically part of your Hong Kong scenarios. Like, they like gave engineers a tough like a tough time because not being able to predict the future. But in the paper, they themselves admit that people started using this in ways that they didn't expect it, and they had to put things like you know throw a cache on it. But 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 yeah, it's it's, it's like I think you know nobody can really predict what the future is going to be like. So like so yeah so mm, so okay. So like, okay, we see the two poster childs, and I was like, all right, the reason that I became interested in it is because actually my, my context and my environment was within the organization that I work in. So, so how is our house? So I was just to like, start going around fastly and see like, how do we do this? And, and areas, and especially areas of the organization that at my, like, I mean the systems team, but there's like many other teams. So I want to see how they did it too, and then what we can leverage, or what can I, when, could I like, what could actually help me in this like cognitive journey that I'm in? And, and, and it's funny because like the old school like uh, web performance people were telling me that load balancing was the only way that, that we did resilience, but they themselves noticed that it has been, it's changed since then. And, and then they've noticed they've been referencing applications that are on my side of the fence as well. So it's very interesting. So I'm gonna talk about two systems that we publicly talked about and, and there are talks about it uh, online. So I will reference you to the talks later and if you're interested in checking it out a little bit more. So the first, the first system is, is our uh, purging system, and it's called Powderhorn. This is Tyler McMullen and then Bruce Pang, and I'm going to use, since I don't have that much time, I'm just gonna use truth for Tyler and Bruce together. So, and, and this talk was given at Velocity in Barcelona last year, and, and they talk about the evolution of our purging system from V1 to V3. And then they, they walk you through all of the design decisions and the assumptions that we did at the beginning, and everything that like gonna screw us up in, in, at the, towards the end. And then at the end of it, like, they, leverage, uh, uh, and, uh, they leverage by Moto Multicast, which is a GOSA protocol, to provide extremely fast purging speeds. So if you're interested in about like, what is the design uh, concerns and system evolution like I was, this is kind of like, it will give you more insight into this, like how do people construct these things. So this is a really good thing. Uh, reading papers was very, very beneficial for us because it made sure that the problem stopped at B3. Who knows how many Vs we would have right now if we weren't actually like if we hadn't run through this piece of uh, piece of like uh, research, and, and and also like it also tells us that planning for resiliency is hard. Uh, as our network expanded, we went from the engineering side of the problem in the in the graph and to the unk unk very very quickly. So new problems popped up, and this is the problem that I have then with unk unk. I think that the problem that, I, that the, the, the the things that are problematic with an unk is that things that you didn't see. But like it's your perspective, right? Like, so if I didn't see it because my universe is like less developed, then I can genuinely say that it was completely unforeseeable for me. But for say somebody more experienced or somebody that has like maybe 20 decades of distributed systems, it would have been something very obvious for them. So I don't like the fact that this is a personal perspective thing, but I am cognizant that it exists. So maybe this is yet another argument of why you should have different cognitive diversity in your team, because like my perspective is just only one data point in this, this, this realm of, of shit that could come and, 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 and murder your application. <laughs> so I went to the other side of the house. So we were at the core, and then now we're going to the edge. How do things look like closer to the internet? And this is my coworker, Joao. I don't know if you can read the bubble, because it's a little bit small, but it says, existing best practices won't save you. He's a very cheerful personality, and those are the things that you're gonna hear him say. But it's really, really good. His team is hiring too. Everybody, everybody's hiring. But this is like Joao looking very, very suave, and me trying to get a photo with him. So Joao told me about the system called FailD. And before I go tell you what it is, then we'll just describe a little bit like a simplification of what our point of presences are. So our pops. So we have this ship called the internet there, where there's like monsters and then ships and everything is awful. And then we have our pop with this little nice little like red little line there. And then traffic comes, and then we have hosts there. And then at some point, like some host will fail. And if the host fails, you have to be able to just like still go to the right host, but take that node out, and then just like bring it back in. So we use this thing called ECMP, called cost multipass. Uh, uh, and then if we use that one, and, and the problem that that protocol had is that it recalculates, it recalculates the tables whenever IPs change. 
So we didn't want node A to go away and then traffic of B to move to the position of node A. So that was a problem that we were running into. So we ended up doing something really clever, which is like, again, the best practices were failing us. So we ended up making, uh, making the system called FailD that allows us to fail and recover hosts uh, via match swap and ACMP uh, on switches. So instead of being on the host, this is apparently the replacement for a system called Keep Alive D which I have no context on, but apparently if you have context on that, then you know what the system is doing. And it runs on switches as opposed to the, to the, to the host. Um, and uh, yeah, so basically what we do is like we make fake IP addresses, we map them to MAC addresses, and then whenever a node fails, the IP address is still there, but then we should switch the MAC address. So this is kind of cool. So if you're interested in this, Joao has a much better explanation on his SRE 15 talk. And it's really, really good, because like, for me, it informed me that, that okay, this, this thing, how it's done at the edge, is basically leveraging things that, that the, the same way that we do it at the core, right? So, all right. But you may say, wait a minute. Uh, we have a myriad of systems then. It's like, wait, wait a minute, why were you where you were whenever you started investigating this? So what I learned is like, okay, in, in every organization, likely you're gonna have like a lot of systems, and then they all have different stages of evolution. So resilient, we have resilient systems like Varnish, Powderhorn, and FLD. They have taught us many lessons, and they have taught us how to do things well, but some applications still have availability issues because I told you, I told you this. this. So why is that, is that? So this is a moment I'm gonna take another second and I drink a little water just to make sure that uh, I don't pick up speed again. But uh, mm, remember where I was. Okay, so uh, why, why do we have these things? So, so what are the things that we fail to construct or fail to consider whenever, whenever we, we run into these problems? So, so this, these are like the, the patterns that, that I picked up, or the patterns that I've distilled that, that seem to be the ones that are more like relevant to me. So redundancies matter. So, so redundancies matter, redundancies of resources, execution paths, checks, uh, replication of data, replay of messages, anti-entropy, anti all of these things like put together, just like they help us with resiliency. Also, uh, uh, gossip and epidemic protocols is also another example of redundancies because it's redundancies of messages as well. And then if we're talking about redundancies, we, uh, this is something that I learned this year as well, that capacity planning matters. Uh, redundancies is like something that is resources. Like, and it's like, yes, it's surplus, but uh, you need to be able to like, again, uh, just like increase, like, the, just like put a boundary of failure between one area that could get, and then just like, just make sure that your failure domain just like doesn't overlap to other, to other systems. All right, so uh, if you can read what the bubble says, optimizations can also make your system less resilient. So say you wanted to run something at a slower cost, or say that you wanted to just like make something uh, like a little bit cheaper or not replicate it as much as you know that you should do or save money on a node instead of having five and you have something that uses quorum and you put like, like two nodes or, or like four, uh, it's not great. So another thing that we've learned then is that operating, operations matter. And uh, we're kind of unaware or we kind of forget where the error boundary is. And, and it means that we're always guessing, right? Like, I mean, we've all pushed applications to production and then we're like, okay, can you really guess where your first bottleneck is gonna come from? Like, I don't, I don't know, like, I, I don't know it. Hopefully you do, uh, but I would say that if you tell me that you do know it, I would actually ask you to show your work because maybe I think you're full of shit. So, <laughs> so yeah, so another thing that is interesting is that complexity of operations makes the system less resilient and more incident prone. It's like, if it takes for like, if it's like so painful to operate, Eventually, people are gonna cut corners and, and, and they're just going, and this sacrifices the resiliency of your system as a whole. And actually, you should worry about operability whenever you're designing, because this is something that comes in design as well. So also, just the biggest cause of security breaches and configuration errors is human error. So like, yeah, so that's great. We're, we're all great. Uh, another thing that I learned is that maybe complexity is, not all complexity is bad. So some of the research talk about the number of complexity and the number of parts in, in airplanes. And then how that is considered a good thing whenever complexity uh, is, is, is there to increase safety. So right now we have like cars and airplanes that are significantly much more complex than what we had like a few years ago, and they're, but they're also like very, very much safer. And again, uh, I mentioned this before, but adding resiliency, it comes at the cost of other desired goals. So, so you should really figure out which one is your goal because if you wanna run something cheap, then you really shouldn't expect something that would be like super resilient and available. And also complexity is unavoidable, so yay. Uh, so since complexity is unavoidable, then we tend to build things that are like highly structured communications, computing and control systems that create barriers to cascading failures. So which, all we're trying to do is just like make sure that, that, that those barriers exist. And we can rely on, uh, we should actually leverage and rely on engineering best practices. 
resiliency and testing are correlated. You should test your system. Uh, also, another thing that is important, you should actually put a versioning, versioning on everything pretty much. Uh, provide, well, yeah, you should version, for example, uh, your APIs, this format. And uh, providing an upgrade pass from day one is very, very useful. Um, uh, upgrades and availability of system is still tricky. If you give a version, then you should also try to support like mixed mode operations, so you can actually run them in parallel and just like flip one versus the other. That would be like much more. It would increase like um, your operational happiness. And I think that there's also like it's kind of shitty because we've seen all of this. We're supposed to put all of these things in practice, and and we're still prototyping systems in a way where like where I was when with my little prototype of things where I was just making these decisions that I wasn't sure if they were go it was going to mean that my system had no chance of even making it. Out of uh, in, in production, so I, I think that I don't know. Like I, I haven't found a better way to think about prototyping. There's the, uh, Yao mentioning her talk. Like the, have even finding a checklist of things that we can borrow from aer like airplanes and then just like start figuring out what we need before we run to production. I found one and it's listed on the references and that was nice, but it's still like by no means comprehensive, right? Like uh, we prototype systems like shit, so. Uh, and, and then this this happens to us. But then again, like I think it's like way too the, the, way too many fronts to attack. And, and and when I'm in the middle of it, it's just like it's hard enough to get something here, and then I have to worry about everything else. So so I think that there's 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 something there that I don't really know how to reconcile. Um, but okay, so we went through a, a whole journey, and I have like oh my god, I have like five minutes to wrap it up. Uh, I think four. So, so what we've seen, we've seen like resiliency matters, so at least it matters to me, and it's something that, that I, I think is like basically why we're doing what we're doing, which is want our things to be up and our businesses to continue to be running. We've seen things in, in, in literature that says that design is important, that, that operations are important, and also like there's, there's things that we're never gonna be able to protect, uh, to protect against. And, 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 and we've seen some samples from like some implementations of these things in industry as well. So like everything that we learned before gets hopefully connected in, in what we're seeing in industry as well. So if you have been uh, asleep through the entire talk, I have a TLDR for you that kind of like meshes everything together. So, so like say then I, it was like me over a year ago when I was trying to look at these things fresh. It's like what are the things that we should put, like, keep, keep in our minds? So while in design, uh, we should be wondering, are we favoring harvest to yield? Harvest to yield, like, I mean, we, we just like, that is a design concern. So like, if we're not doing the design, we're eventually like, just like, not gonna have it, have it well done. So we can leverage orthogonality and decomposition. For example, in the Chubby paper, people, like the engineers don't worry about those things, but then engineers were able to rely on Chubby, and Chubby did all of these things, and that was like an orthogonal way to actually get, for example, member elections, and then have those member elections be highly available as well. Do we have enough redundancies in place while we're designing? It's like, ah, do you know how this system is going to operate? What is the load that you have? Uh, you can expect. Do we have we like give it enough like breathing room? Have we given enough padding? Uh, are we resilient to uh, are, are we resilient to our dependencies? What if one of our dependencies fa like fails again? It's like, are we favoring harvest or are we favoring yield? And that shit is a, is a business decision. So you should know which one your business needs you to favor. And also that theory matters. So you can continue reinventing the same thing and then just make mistakes. And then again, the unk unk is a problem of perspective. So if my perspective is flawed, maybe somebody who has researched this for fucking decades would actually have a better perspective than mine. Operability. Uh, am I providing enough control to my operators? Like, can, can people actually do their job with the thing that I provide to them? Also, an interesting one is like, do I want to be on call for this? It's like, I know you know how to operate it, but do you really want to be on call for this? So that is a good one. Uh, uh, and also, I think uh, it's like, we should run your, rank your services based on what can be dropped, killed, and deferred. And, and that is also listed in the references. But it's like very important, because whenever an incident happens, you know exactly, it informs your operational activities. And, and OK, do we have monitoring and alerting in place? Again, like the, then we have this, this again, this thing of unk unks. And I think that, that, again, it's like, yes, matter of perspective. I can't cover absolutely everything. But I think it also stresses, it stresses diligence on the other two, because it's a way that we can actually make it survive it whenever it comes. And then have we done everything we can? And if we think that we've done everything we can, I think maybe Camille was like, you should meditate in the flames of the tires. I am much more uh, a, a proponent of uh, human sacrifices and abandoning hope. So I think one or the other, like maybe you have interns, it's like, it's like it requires blood. <laughs> so, so yes, so you can just do that. I, I think, I mean, there's like, there's, yeah, leadership styles. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 
I like the meditation bit whenever I'm on the engineering side. Uh, yeah, so well in design, uh, again, so it's a little bit more pleasant, let's try to be a little bit more practical. Well, again, we should test our dependency failures. Code reviews are not the same thing as tests, and this is covered in the Chubby paper. You can have a test, obviously you have to do it, but then the, 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 the Chubby team still reviewed the code of applications that were gonna be relying on Chubby because they got bit by people leveraging the system in ways that they don't want to. So they're not the same, you should have both. Um, also, you should distrust client behavior, even if they're internal, because uh, believe it or not, even at Google, like, there's just like, it's, it's, it's like really, really easy to DDoS yourself and it's much more easier to do this yourself than somebody else, so depending, like, I mean, we're a CDN, so, so we're like at the edge. So, so, so there was a talk at, at Velocity this year by one of the Google managers, and she says that like, it's much more likely for them to do this themselves, so I'm, I'm paraphrasing her. And also you should check some all the things, check some your, like, the, anything that you write to disk, even things that you, you write to memory. So a friend of ours, Jordan, is, uh, works on Cassandra, and he told us that there was this thing where like memory at some point flipped, and then Cassandra had in their, in their membership, like the membership information, a note that they didn't know before, and then all of a sudden started talking about to, to it. So now they put like checksum in, even in the, the group membership thing that is in memory, not in this. So you should do like, okay, things like error handlers, circuit, circuit break-ins, back pressure, leases, timeouts, all of these things are here to help you. And when it comes to operability, any automation shortcut that you take while you're in a rush is gonna come back and haunt you. And by haunt you, I mean something else. Uh, yeah, so, so I'm trying to clean up my language here. So, but also, like, I, I've noticed this thing too that it's like really stability, like sometimes it's, like, it's often tied to like how stable your system is. So, so if you don't really have ironed out your release process, then you're even adding more on this pile of things that are gonna come and, and get you. Also, it's interesting that I learned, I learned this year, I guess, it's like all of these are like very humble opinions about the, 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 if you have an alert, you should link to something that is actionable to it because you're being kind to your operators. Whoever is gonna be on call and gets this alert needs to know how to react to it. And if you don't do it, then you're basically just like, you're basically signing up to be the person that gets woken up because nobody else can deal with your, with your application. And, and another thing that was interesting too is that since we're thinking about configuration as interfaces, some standardization in, in, in interfaces is, is actually a good thing. So if you have a system that gets configured one way, for example, if you put a data bag thing on Chef, and the other one is just a config file, and one person is switching from one to the other, it becomes less intuitive to do. So I learned that uh, this year too. And also, like again, the operators of our system determine resilient. This is my last slide, uh, and, and I also promise you a antifesto. And the biggest thing that I think I took away is that we can't really recover from lack of design. Not minding things like harvest and yield like means that we sign up for a, a redesign of our system the moment we, f we finish it. So, so just like you can't really bolt on things like security, availability, resilience, and, and, and orthogonality really can help us. But if you don't have a service that is already available in your, in your, in your company, then basically you're just like building something that you know from the get-go is not gonna be, it's not gonna be good. So I think this was what, what we maybe missed on some of the systems that I had, that, that, that I was encountering problems with. And, and, and I think maybe as, as a company, we're gonna have to start making a choice. Maybe we're getting to the point where we're like small, we're not as big as, as Google or Netflix, but at some point we may wanna have, we, we, I think we're gonna, we're starting thinking about like maybe just like we should put a service behind this or we should provide a library. And, and I think when you're small, like that, that trade-off is always either you use a library or like, or you just YOLO it and, and, and that is interesting. So, all right, so that is at the, the end of the talk, but I would like to thank the people that helped me. They're all in this one, and then I never have time for questions because I always use, again, I run my system at, at the very edge. Uh, and and, and I, I prepare a repo for you where you can actually open a pull request or just say hi or whatever if you have any questions. And then all of the things that I mentioned in the talk and the extra references and the extra paper are listed there. So, so thank you very much. Uh, hopefully it wasn't too bad, Norma. So, yeah. So, and yeah, and this is how short I am. Yeah. So, hi, guys. Whew.